context that we felt it was important to pause and to take stock of the kind of projects, particularly student projects we've been supporting and um, and to work and reflect uh, with that uh, knowledge. Now the starting premise for the Emancipatory Future Studies project is the idea that the subaltern can think, the subaltern can make, can create alternative futures. And when we're talking about the subaltern, we are talking about trade unionists, we are talking about grassroots women, we are talking about peasants, uh, we are talking about local communities. So we're really talking about those who are outside the power structures, those who are on the margins, um, who are dispossessed, who are exploited, and basically at the heart of oppression. They are the victims of oppression. So that's the starting point and premise of emancipatory future studies. But despite that, given that we are now going to be thinking with all the research we've done, I'd like this colloquium to address certain issues. So if we look at the sort of title of this project, Emancipatory Future Studies in the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene sets or delimits a sort of parameter for our research area and our research focus. And the Anthropocene is a category and a concept that has been developed by Earth scientists. And it's the shorthand for human impacts, the Anthropos, the human impact on our planetary life world. But it's also a shorthand for planetary crisis that we are living through. The idea of the Anthropocene has really come to the fore by ge geographers and earth scientists who've been concerned about what's been happening over the past 150 years uh, of industrial civilization. And uh, no, this is fine, I think. This is okay. Of 100, 150 years of industrial civilization, the great exploration that happened from the mid 1950s onwards. In this context, we are beginning to learn that we are overshooting tree boundaries, not just the climate boundary. We are sh overshooting the nitrogen cycle, um, acidification of oceans, biodiversity loss, and so on. So at one level, the Anthropocene is about ecological crisis that we are living, okay? And it's a multifaceted poly-ecological crisis. So it's a tool of critique, if you like. The other point about the Anthropocene is that it prompts us to think about the underlying material foundations of this ecological crisis. Where does capitalism fit in to this ecological crisis? And again, thinking with your research, thinking with what you've been doing, we are going to be grappling with what are the subaltern alternatives emerging vis-a-vis -vis the ecological crisis, the planetary crisis. Uh, what are futures that the subaltern is living now um, to address these challenges? So that's the first point I want to make about this idea of the Anthropocene and how we as a collective, as a cohort, are trying to give it definition and meaning. I think the other point I want to make is about this idea of emancipatory or emancipation. Now, different social theorists and thinkers have grappled with this concept. In the 20th century, particularly anti-colonial struggles, threw up a conception of liberation. Liberation from a particular kind and particular form of oppression. So Franz Fanon, for example, in The Wretched of the Earth, was envisaging the subaltern overturning a colonial order, okay? And he envisaged a particular role for violence in that process. But is emancipation just about what we are against? And this is something, again, I hope 
in journeying over the next day and a half, we clarify. I want to contend that emancipation is not just about what we're against. It's not just about being against the oppressions, the suffering, the exploitation, and so on. Emancipation is also about what we want, the four. What do we want to construct? What kind of life worlds do we want to build? What are the alternative futures, again, uh, that are coming through to the fore? So I want us, again, over the day and a half, to really unpack the nature of emancipation, okay, together from your work. In terms of futures, we never can tell what the future is. Uh, that's a basic truth, okay? But future making is something that is happening okay in our socio ecological practices and in the context of the ecological crises of capitalist anthropocene we are making particular futures for some we have to reproduce the system we have that has brought us into this problem we have to green capitalism. We have to tweak it, but we keep most of what drives it. It's logic, it's ecocidal uh, dynamic, the destruction of human and non-human life on a mass scale. We keep all of that going, but you know, we just get some solar panels in play. We add on a bit of recycling and you know, uh, maybe we get a few gardens going in communities and all is going to be well. So that's one way of living the future, okay? There are other ways of living the future, which again, you've been trying to kind of unearth, you've been trying to discover, and you've been trying to study, these future-making practices. So these future-making practices are what we are all about, is trying to find them and, and, and bring them to the surface. So, in terms of studies, and I think, again, this is the challenge of our day and a half, is to try and work out, firstly, what kind of research foci are you working with within the remit of emancipatory future studies? Uh, and so what is the breadth and depth of this research agenda? We're also trying to work out what kind of theoretical approaches have you been developing and working with? Uh, to understand emancipatory futures. There's a whole body of critical thought. There's a whole body of um, theory uh, that does feature the subaltern. Um, you know, you have uh, forms of eco-feminism uh, that brings to the fore the agency of women, uh, particularly grassroots women. You have um, Marxist ecology, which also features logical working class, uh, and so on. So you have different theoretical approaches um, to um, this kind of uh, research foci. And we want to kind of learn from you about what kind of theory you've been developing and elaborating and so on. We also want to learn about methodologies. So how are you studying your research foci? Okay. Uh, what are these methodologies that could, if you like, help us understand emancipatory future making? Uh, is it case studies? Um, is it archival work? Um, is it more immersive um, sort of ethnographic work? Uh, what is going on? What is the kind of method methodological kind of tools that you are using uh, that we can bring now in a more systematic way within the remit of emancipatory future studies? The other issue is you know, we're talking about the relationship between humans, stroke, human societies, and the planet. That's what we're grappling with. Okay, now that's a very complicated relationship. But it's a relationship that also requires us to transgress disciplinary boundaries. Okay. So again, over the next day and a half, we want to learn from you about how you are going beyond just narrow disciplinary focuses. Or maybe you are still there 
uh, and there is a richness there that you are grappling with, um, that you are finding. Maybe you're upending certain disciplinary uh, uh, sort of orthodoxies and assumptions. Uh, maybe in international relations, uh, we're realizing that our units of analysis, our ontology is not adequate. Um, so we want to learn from you um, about disciplines. Um, are we are we finding convergence in knowledge? Are we building bridges beyond our disciplines to understand this complex human planetary relationship? Uh, are we are we kind of reaching for kind of ecological ideas that can reground um, our disciplines and so on? Are we thinking natural relations? Are we bringing natural relations into well, if you look at the social sciences, and I'm glad that one of our core research group members is Mucha Swana, who's um, the head of our school. I mean, the social sciences are largely anthropocentric. They are developed around the idea of um, civil society, uh, the state and the economy, okay, and culture. These are the main ideas, and these ideas are basically about humans, humans making meaning in culture, humans uh, organizing society, humans constructing society. And so, you know, the kind of knowledge uh, project that we are busy with, are we going beyond that? Are we going beyond the anthropocentrism of our disciplines? Okay. Uh, this is very, very important. I mean, at a larger scale, what we are actually envisaging is a challenge to the old humanism that underpins even the humanities. And I'm hoping that we are going there together. We are refinding a, a new humanism, a humanism of humans in nature. Uh, humans is what I prefer to call um, ecological beings, okay? So are we going there together in our research, uh, in our transgressions, in our convergence around knowledge, and in our inquiry? So. I'm hoping the this day and a half is is going to really be rich, and I know it is, uh, based on your research. So, we've got a full program, and I just I just want to make it known that um, some of you have gone further than others. Um, some of you have, um, you know, got your proposals in place. You've been doing field work. You've been working at this um, uh, research question for a long time, and so. While on the other hand, some of you are just in the starting blocks. Uh, you've got your research proposals in place, your starting field work, etc. So that's fine. Uh, I think this is a, this is a space where we're going to be learning from each other. We're going to be empowering each other. So despite this unevenness, um, it's going to be fun. So we have a program for today, and we've organized it around particular research foci, climate crisis time which is a crucial thrust. And we have a lovely panel here with Hanali uh, uh, Warrington Kutsia on eco art, science, path making strategies. We had Courtney Van Niekerk on the role of natural disasters in shaping individual perceptions of climate change in Africa and Janet Solomon on interventionist documentary matters delinking the ocean from petro-imperialism. We'll have a tea break and then we'll work with the team systemic Change pathways. Here we have Yanni Swart van Billion on subaltern waste management alternatives in an emerging circular economy and eco masters Marxist thematic analysis. Vincent Siwawa, a bottom up smart city approach to solid waste management, the case of ICT enabled waste reclaimer system in two South African cities. We have Kudakwashe Majonjo trade union investment companies promoting worker control and a solidarity economy in South Africa, question mark. We then have a panel this afternoon after lunch on decolonizing futures. We have Baba Tunde Ogundwini on community-owned farm settlement schemes, exploring an agrarian spatial thought. Charles Simane on understanding subaltern responses to biological piracy propagated by global patent laws post-1994. We have uh, Gwinyai Tarawunga, uh, Water Governance and the Colonial Legacy in Zimbabwe. 
Nokutenda and Thule adaptation strategies against drought and agricultural production, the case of subsistence farmers in Impejo village, Vembe district municipality Limpopo. Tatenda Sean Takawira on complexities in the integration of indigenous small scale farming in the modern agricultural economy, a case study of the Zivosve in Zimbabwe. And then we have a last panel for today on techno emancipatory futures. Um, we have Edmund uh, Madhua, uh, who is looking at the persistent health burden, understanding black South African working class men's experience of living with tuberculosis. And then we have Jane, um, uh, sorry, not Jane. <laughs> we have um, Ruth Intlokotse, uh, who will be talking about worker control and um, uh, in the context of the National Union of Mine Workers strategy. I somehow have the old program. Uh, we did put your, your topic in, Jay, um, Ruth, um, in the revisions that we made. Tomorrow we have two panels, one on systemic change pathways uh, with Becca Muzi Bebe on water commodification and conflicts in South Africa, state and subaltern responses in Imalashleni and Makanda, uh, DeAndre Chen on food sovereignty and counter hegemonic multi scala governance in Africa, Hein Mare on can a universal basic income help achieve a just transition in South Africa, Roland Nigam on environmental justice and climate reparations. And the final panel is on grand ecocentric futures. Awande Butalezi on the Green New Deal as counter hegemony. Fredson Guelengi, uh, Cyclone Idai, the political economy of the Mozambican state and progressive social movements responses to unprecedented cyclonic climate shocks. And Ola, we're going to revisit your title, Fredson. Uh, Wanju Umupeni, the geopolitics of climate change and violent conflicts in Africa, the Nigerian and Kenyan perspective. So, full full program and agenda for the next day and a half. Um, before I get to housekeeping details, I'll just make one other point. We have a booklet um, which contains all the abstracts, but at the end of the booklet, we also have a list of publications that we've developed um, uh, through our core research group um, over the past four years. Um, the list includes edited volumes and special issues, uh, book chapters, uh, it includes journal articles. I'll just mention one or two just just to um, kind of um, give some flavor uh, around the kind of work we've been doing. Uh, I just want to focus on um, on one article here, say co-authored with Michelle Williams, who is also part of the core research group, Polani, Nature and the International, the Missing Dimension of Imperial Ecocide. So Carl Polanyi wrote a classic text called The Great Transformation, and it was published in 1944, and he was trying to understand how marketization of societies produced a kind of counter response. In this case, he was trying to understand the rise of fascism. He was trying to understand Soviet central planning um, and the kind of uh, New Deal arrangements that emerged during the interwar crisis. Uh, Carl Polanyi, um, actually has a very interesting conception of how markets destroy nature and natural relations. And so this article, which was which was published in a journal, um, it, uh, sorry, in a book, is about trying to kind of foreground his understanding of natural relations. And Carl Polanyi kind of draws attention to how capitalism understands nature as an object of exploitation the commodification of nature, okay, in its waves of marketization. While it's a brilliant text and it has been like a classic has been revived uh, over the past four decades of neoliberalization, but Carl Polanyi does not situate the logic of imperial ecocide, how over 500 years this logic has also been destroying our life world. So that's one intervention. Um, another intervention um, here, which has been co-authored with Jackie Koch, is about a chapter in a book, is about eco-socialist activism and movements in South Africa. And it's, and it's really about where the frontline struggles in South Africa against carbon capitalism. Uh, communities that are in mining, uh, coal mining areas, how are they envisaging a world beyond the disasters of coal mining? Uh, communities that have been gripped by the drought, 
and how have they been thinking beyond day zero and the kind of uh, climate crisis um, experience, um, hunger in our society, and how have social forces been envisaging a new kind of food system, a food sovereignty system, and so on. So in a sense, this article provides a mapping of different subaltern forces in South Africa that want a different kind of ecological society. Okay, so I mean, there's also contributions by Mucha uh, in here, his own journey, disrupting environmental history and and how he has kind of uh, worked with the discipline of environmental history, how he has contributed to the discipline of environmental history and um, and what is its um, kind of frontiers uh, in terms of his own research and so on. So I'm proud to say that, you know, the colleagues in in our group um, have been breaking ground, but the next day and a half is about you. And and this is where we are really going to be learning from each other, uh, from your work. And now some housekeeping details before we get on with the program. Um, we are going to be having participants online. Um, some of our students could not make it. Um, and so, for example, one of them is in um, Canada right now. W one of them is in Switzerland and another one is in Ethiopia. So we actually are transnational cohort. <laughs> so some of them will come online and contribute to our conversation. Actually, some of them are in Zimbabwe, I think. I'm not sure where Kuda is at the moment. So they'll participate online. Who We're going to organize a panel. I'll chair the first panel. Everyone's going to have 15 minutes, but I'll constantly kind of look back um, to, to, to get some sense of what's going on in the chat group to ensure online participants are integrated. Uh, and of course, we'll, um, uh, we'll make sure that every chair uh, who chairs a panel, we have self-organized the panels. I'm only going to share the first one um, and um, to, to kind of volunteer chairing uh, other panels. So this is a self-organizing space. Um, Self-management by the interesting um, emancipatory futures concept um, as part of the worker control. OK, here I'm giving power to you as students to control the discourse. OK, anyway. So that's how we're going to do that. Um, we have planned tea breaks, lunch breaks, etc. So we've got to really stick to time. It's a packed program, 15 minutes for everybody. And once again, um, thank you to all of you for making the time, for being in the space. It's going to be exciting. All right. Can we call up the panelists for the first panel? Uh, and maybe I should also say thank you for wearing your masks. I mean, I have long COVID. I don't know about all of you. Um, my doctors don't know what will happen to me if I get COVID again. I was bedridden for two months, um, so I'm just wearing my mask. <laughs> OK, thank you. OK, so for those who don't know me, my name is Courtney Pontecat. I'm busy with my master's in international relations. Um, and yeah, as per the program, the title of my research is the role of natural disasters in. Sure, is that better? OK, <laughs> sorry, I'm naturally quiet, so you'll just have to push me. <laughs> um, the role of natural disasters in shaping individual perceptions of climate change and grassroots environmental movements in African states. Um, so I am still at the proposal stage. I only started my MA this year, so I just got approval to start. So everything is basically just taken from my proposal. Um, so I'll just get started with that. My problem statement is that one aspect which has been addressed in global research um, is the effect that public perceptions of climate change have on increasing support for climate movements and climate policies, um, which then improves overall climate action on a large scale. Um, from these studies, there's variables like um, access to information, gender, living circumstances that affect that. But um, something like natural disasters is something that's often overlooked. Um, and from my research, at least, the role of these natural disasters is really important. Um, and focusing on the individual response to natural disasters 
will reflect the relationship between that individual and the environment. Um, because as most of us know, um, individual beliefs and understandings are often land-based and that's something that's often overlooked. Um, then where individuals experience natural disasters and have concern for climate change, it's becoming increasingly relevant to study the manifestation of environmental movements as a response. So that brings me to my research question. How do natural disasters in African states impact individual perceptions of climate change? And then where states are exposed to a high frequency of natural disasters, what are the implications of these natural disasters, as well as individual perceptions for the interests and actions of grassroots environmental movements? So everything on a very kind of technical basis. Um, so my proposed hypothesis is that states with higher levels of natural disasters will have increased levels of concern for climate change amongst individuals. So where states have increased levels of concern for climate change, um, it is hypothesized that this will influence the interests and actions of environmental grass, grassroots movements. Um, so moving on to the literature, um, some studies contend that geographical location influences the actions of grassroots environmental movements and suggests that comparative case studies are the most effective approach to understanding these movements. Um, the importance of grassroots environmental movements is emphasized, claiming that these movements often act as incubators for social change. Um, in this way, comparing grassroots environmental movements by geographic, cultural, and other factors um, unearth the most effective ways in which these movements perform. So the ultimate goal is to have these movements performing at their most optimal, most effective level, um, which is my goal, hopefully, at the end of the study. Um, so some scholars also indicate that the initial approach to climate change was in educating the public with scientific information um, to encourage changes in behaviors and attitudes towards um, climate change. But more recently, it's been argued that contextual factor, factors, personal experience, and societal factors have a larger impact on individuals' response to climate change. So those kind of large-scale um, awareness-raising campaigns aren't as effective as our own personal experience. Um, so this highlights the necessity to consider climate change perceptions from a more holistic perspective. Um, one author in particular, uh, Lauren Zoni, contends that influencing individual perceptions of climate change and therefore changing behaviors and actions for sustainable development is of equal importance as civic engagement in the democratic process. Essentially, the study of public perceptions of climate change is the initial step in creating meaningful change in individual attitudes to climate change, thus allowing for solutions to be implemented whether through policy making or through actions on behalf of these movements. Um, then we've got um, the issue of climate skeptics who often do not support climate change policies, which encourages research into understanding the factors which cause this low level of concern for climate change. Um, however, often these studies have been done in developed states where majority of the population is aware of climate change and then choose not to believe in the science, um, which when you study from the so-called global north, that excludes a whole bunch of people that don't have access to information, don't know that climate change is even a phenomenon. So talking it all up to climate skeptics is not that effective. Um, then um, Lawrence Zoni again, same author, emphasizes that engagement with the climate change issue is not merely an awareness for climate change and its causes, but a process wherein individuals care about climate change and are motivated to take action in solving it. Um, it's also argued that climate policies are at risk of reject, rejection or ineffectiveness within a public which lacks an understanding of climate change. Um, this is fundamental in approaching climate change solutions in African states as climate policies and public engagement through environmental movements may not be as successful in states where individuals are not only unconcerned for climate change, but equally lack an awareness for the phenomenon at large. Um, 
Then moving on to empirical literature, uh, many scientifically supported long-term consequences of climate change, such as deforestation and desertification, impact individuals in a substantially minimal kind of indirect way at present, um, with climate change effects presenting more clearly over many years. Um, on the other hand, natural disasters have a more salient and direct impact on individuals and thus provide provides the potential for research on the effects of these natural disasters on individual perceptions of climate change. Then there's also the difference between climate activism in the global south and the global north, where um, in the global south, it's often rooted in hope, fear, anger, desperation, um, because these individuals are personally experiencing climate related disasters when the global north, it's more a fear of the potential of what could happen to them. Um, and that's a very important distinction to make when you're considering policies or movements, um, because a lot of these campaigns like greenwashing, they their ideas of what could happen to them, whereas we have people here who are in the middle of it and they need to now make a plan to kind of live within that circumstance. Um, and then on to finally my research design. Um, so my research design is a mixed methods uh, kind of nested approach. So I'm starting with a quantitative study of 34 African states, as well as a large end study of individuals from each of those African states, uh, followed by a qualitative case study of two African states. Um, this will be determined from the quantitative study. Um, so the nested design will first establish an empirical relationship between public perception of climate change and natural disasters. Um, they're after using content analysis to explore the context within which uh, these perceptions of climate change are informed. So my DV dependent variable will be public perception of climate change. Um, data is coming from Afrobarometer, so I won't have to be doing any field work. Uh, so the survey questions are all environment related. Some of them are climate change specific. So asking them, have you heard of climate change? Do you believe in climate change? Are you concerned for climate change? Some of them are less so focused on climate change and more on the environment. So asking the individual, have you personally experienced an increase in droughts or an increase in floods? Um, so that's kind of combating the fact of if people aren't aware of climate change. They still have that knowledge of the environment and their personal experience. Um, and I'm also using geocoded data. So it's specific to the geographic region um, because you can, you can question a thousand people within one country all experiencing a different kind of environment. I mean, just in South Africa, you could have people living in a desert or in a forest. So um, yeah, looking at natural disasters and individuals I'm on my last paragraph. Um, so yeah, looking at um, that, so at a kind of closer, more individual level. Um, and then, yeah, so far my limitations are that the Afrobarometer data is only available for 34 countries. I can't um, look at, I can't generalize to the whole African continent, just those 34 countries. But looking at individuals, my study pool is um, between 1,000 and 2,000 from each of 2,000 people from each country. Um, and then hopefully it'll be a big kind of mapping study so you can look at a map and see track how this relationship manifests. Um, and then my last limitation is potential for field work for the case studies um, because I'll be deciding my case studies based on the quantitative study. I can't give any more information until I've done that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share some visuals with you cause I'm an artist <laughs> and uh, um, I find it tricky to just talk. Um, so thanks so much Vish for <laughs> inviting me back again and again. Um, I was one of the first people to receive this amazing um, support in 2019. And um, 
that really kick-started a lot of things. Um, and in the meanwhile, I've done a Master of Science at the Global Change Institute, where I basically worked with um, transformation and how transdisciplinarity um, could create new path-making strategies. So, yeah, I've just heard that I've passed, so I'm really excited. <laughs> Um, and I must just say also to the science departments, it's amazing that they let me in without an undergrad degree. So this is really from a practitioner's experience that it's now gone into the sciences. And so the sciences are evolving. <laughs> so I'll run through a few slides um, just very briefly. Um, but just at the outset, I'm very much a collaborator um, and I love to problem solve. So if you feel any resonance, please do contact me and brainstorm some ideas how to make things happen. As a practitioner, you know, the theoretical side's hugely inspiring, but it's the rollout that, that makes it real for me. Um, I'm not going to go into all of that detail <laughs> at this point. I think I'll do it later. Um, so to give you a sense of just the works that I've recently done since I started the Emancipatory Futures journey, I often, I mean, as an artist, you have to make a living. And in South Africa, we have very small arts industry. So to work it out and not teach because I really suck at teaching. Um, I take on commissioned work and often that comes from industry or developers or mines. And I use those platforms to learn from a very grassroots perspective. So what you see here are some creatures that I've made for the Ango Platinum <laughs> collection. I went to their scrapyards at the mines and I had access to the, um, the obsolete archives. So it's a little, little slip thing on the head of the baboonish creature. And the hangers that makes up the body is the hangers that they actually pick up the platinum casts with. So as I'm meeting the CEOs and everybody else, I keep my eye on the ground and pick up waste basically and then bounce that back to them so this series of creatures were all very much about what transformation looks like from what i've learned in this kind of space and how business thinks of transformation how disconnected that word is from industry to theory it's two different worlds so um what was very inspiring for me having this conversation with, um, with people in Anglo was transformation for them from a safety perspective have evolved hugely. And they have now, where in the past they might have had miners deep in the mines, very exposed to very dangerous conditions, a lot of that's um, now computer operated by skilled black women above ground. So it's much safer. And how they evolve their, all their innovations is to make it better for everybody. Um, in the process, these creatures were then visiting very uh, um, out of the box for them, I suppose. You know, they've got an art collection that's um, historically always been quite hidden and they've got a new curator now that shows much more contemporary things but these works connected to them because they are from their own processes um, and it's a massive industry so they will be visiting origin center next year um, and you know, that kind of conversation can come outside of their own collection as well. Anyway, um, 
So just um, recently, in July this year, um, I did a sustainability work related work for a new sculpture park in Denmark. They had a massive storm in the beginning of the year. And the, so they had this fallen ash tree that was lying there exactly on the spot where my sculpture was going to be. <laughs> so I thought that was an optimal moment for me to actually just deconstruct the fallen tree instead of moving a massive something into place. So the root system is still connected. Um, and decaying slowly. So I didn't want to um, displace the the insects that's already in the tree. Um, often with tree ecology, when a, when a big tree falls, it creates a whole new ecosystem. And I wanted to be mindful with that and also not to damage the forest floor too much. Um, so this is a sea creature that are built. The, um, it's close to the Danish coast and they basically have historically had these filter feeders. This is a fossil that they found. The filter feeders, 500 million years old, naturally filtered the ocean floor. And because the sustainability goal that I had to work with innovation and industry, um, I thought, to pose the question back to the audience, so the work's subtitle is how can we learn from these filter feeders how to filter the microplastics out of the ocean, seeing that this work is right next to the ocean. Um, so I always invite audiences to co-learn, brainstorm, come up with solutions, and there will be a educational component that rolls out with the province with this kind of work where was this dialogue continues. So these works then slowly decay in these sculpture parks and in the process they create a place to have conversation outside of a school classroom or so. Um, <clears throat> some of the older works that um, also were in forests. I visited this one now. I built the Salto in 2015, and there's a whole ecosystem that's moved in there. So I'm linking up with the University of Lund, um, and we're interested to see how this, as an insect hotel log stack sculpture, um, increased productivity in the agricultural lands that's adjacent to the forest. So I'm flipping the inquiries around where the agricultural forest, forestry and forestry industries would usually lead these questions. I'm flipping it around and asking if we create insect habitat that helps the agriculture productivity. Um, you know, how would that future, what would that future look like? So we seem to have some movements on these oddball questions. Um, and I've just had discussions around this um, with uh, Dutch productivity as well. And I'm interested to see how it links back to innovation that um, that serves everybody. Um, seem to be a bit stuck. That's just part of the this thing's not moving on. That was just part of the building process to give you a sense of scale. Um, 2015. What I've learned from the 2015 sculpture is we really damaged the forest floor. You know, we had access to all these massive lumber machines and things, and I chose to not make that available in the recent Danish work because it's it's just too damaging and the older technologies was like a block and tackle and sort of the logic of gravity um, is much better for the ecology. So it was tricky. I couldn't buy a block and tackle in Denmark. <laughs> it was insane. I had to borrow one from, from a neighbor. 
that was completely like a hundred years old and rusted. <laughs> they don't have that kind. Of, like, yeah, we can just go buy it, you know, but um, it's very machined spaces. Everything is um, mechanized. Um, uh, also, just with regards to these sculpture parks and how they operate, they often have um, educational components that make sense with the arts. So in 2015, they asked me to work on an educational component that links to my work in that forest. And um, as a foreigner, I arrive and, you know, sort of make some suggestions. And um, at the time, 2015, they had an influx of refugees. I think it was about eight or nine percent of their schools changed within a few years to refugee kids being schooled in southern Sweden and this was the first opportunity that those refugee children had to voice their fear of the forest. The Swedish kids don't have that fear. They grow up with the fear of the forests being magical and places of inspiration and relaxation. But with the refugees' children's um, trauma, they arrived not even being comfortable to just walk into it. And this surfaced in a very eloquent way through this process in the forest with the refugee children, completely unplanned, no intention, but it created a safe space for the children to voice that. And so 5,000 children from the province of Skana, the southern province in Sweden, had that experience that they could then take with them. Um, and, you know, that's the important thing for me that I would like to share with the arts, is that it's got these subtle ways of transforming. And by creating spaces where there's a warmth and inclusion, you actually cannot determine beforehand what the transformation might look like. So very often when I make artworks, I've got some kind of an idea of uh, a sense that I'd like to bring to the table. Um, and then that's open for a lot of things. So you got to stay very open and on your toes. Um, so this work I made at Nyrox, basically extracting black wattle trees from a spring and by extracting them, this the spring could actually flow again. So the material contributes to the regenerative aspects of the of the actual artwork. It's also an insect hotel. It's got a snake living in it. The monkeys love playing <laughs> on it. Um, and I've just inoculated it with some mushrooms. So these works become also places for me to learn and share. There's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to go through everything. I think I'm over time already. OK, I'll just go through a little bit of the theoretical stuff that I've just finished. Um, so with relational echo art is how I describe it, where you're building relationships through public artworks. There's a very innovative space between disciplines. If you look at the slide with the yellow in the middle, these surprising places where where that happens. Um, so I'm not going to go through any of these examples, but what I found, what really stood out while I was studying is the transdisciplinarity space for innovation is so rich um, because new solutions, new complex solutions sits outside of all the disciplines. So there's a leveler. And in a way, climate change for me is also a leveler because you know it takes so many of the hierarchies out of things a few are sort of like <coughs> struck by some climate change tipping point um historically it might have gotten there because of a whole lot of decisions but when it hits you it doesn't discriminate um, so what i did was the theoretical components i took a whole lot of theoretical um sort of papers that's advising researchers how to design transformation and I compared that to how I do it in practice and 
just pointed out the differences and the similarities in the thesis, which I can only share once I've like passed past. <laughs> Sorry, so these slides are just some extracts. So I worked very much with Nicoleska's hidden third theory, which was fascinating because in the middle, between internal and external spaces, um, there are these magical places where spirituality, religion, art, these things are unifiers. Um, and it's not like a hardcore rule, but it brings, it can even hold contradictions. You don't have to agree to go forward, but it can hold contradiction in one place. So Nicolesco's transdisciplinarity was very informative in my study. And then also rhizome theory, where things connect in a very organic way. Um, I wanted to show just this is a closing slide. I found it very interesting. Actually, only found it after my study. Just sort of explaining where this kind of transgressive work that happens in the arts sits right on the top right hand side with eco feminist, um, even eco queer theory where, you know, it's almost so out of the box, but it's so green within itself. Um, so I was very happy to find that, you know, the, the study where, where I focus the transformation and where that could happen really happens in these um, places that's about other types of knowledge. So, you know, this serious historical approach to academia really needs to marry <laughs> the grassroots stuff. Um, it's not going to make any sense. The, to find the spaces in between, it wouldn't make sense because it's not um, it's not rooted in 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 lived experience. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Janet. Interventionist doc documentary matters, delinking the ocean from petro imperialism. Yeah, I am. I am using the arrows. They're very slow. OK, cool. Thank you. A politics of mapping South Africa's oceans as territory for use allocated to expanding oil and gas extraction has been pre-legitimized by an energy crisis rhetoric and government's economic development imaginary operation Pakisa. This vision for a hurried up South African gas future is escalating applications aiming for 30 new offshore oil and gas wells by 2030. Considering carbon emission induced effects to global warming, its consequential sea level rise, sorry, I've missed it. consequential sea level rise, um, acidification and ocean and oxygen loss already disrupting global weather and impacting global biodiversity, the logic of developing a national appetite for gas is questionable. The South African government has endorsed oil and gas acreage dominating 93% of its one and a half million square kilometers ocean commons, which it represents as a blank. Sociologists Hetherington and Lee argue that the undetermined blank in issues of social and spatial order is able to produce what pass for homogenous social orders. The evacuating logic of the relational structure of offshore Pakisa to the sea and its dependence is a colonizing rationality that eco-feminist uh, philosopher Val Plumwood calls denial by backgrounding. Backgrounding rooted in the illusory entitlement of human ecological independence encourages an imprudent denial of others' agency and neglect until something goes wrong. Recent offshore application environmental scoping reports describe some deep sea environment, environments as an unknown. For Plumwood, creation of a rational deficit invites commodif commodification without restriction and instrumental governance, a blank on which to trace Pakisa's appropriative seismic survey hash lines 
or an abyss where toxic and radioactive drill cuttings can be discarded. Backgrounding normalizes risk to an already vulnerable sea and those who depend on it, and assumes its composition change as inevitable. Focusing a lens on stakeholder concerns can advance an alternate relational understanding of oceanic space and a call for marine justice. The proposed wells are pivotal in the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy's gas master plan, which projects 4,000 megawatts of electricity by 2030 by piping methane gas off the seabed. Plans are developed for a three and a half thousand kilometer national methane pipeline and infrastructural build along the coastline. All of which awaits first gas from the Padifisi well earliest by 2028, meaning a longer to build than renewable alternatives. Offshore Pakisa hopes to produce 370,000 oil barrels a day by 2030, but fails to highlight how the extra 58 million tonnes of produced CO2 a year affects South Africa's emissions budget. Just to explain this, that's fairly self-explanatory, climate events at the top in the orange, um, South Africans' climate commitments in, orange, um, in green in the middle, and below you'll see the minimum lifespans of any gas builds. Of concern is offshore Pakisa's influence over ocean governance. Simultaneous to the 2014 launch of offshore Pakisa, sections 38 and 39 of the Mineral Petroleum Resources Act, triggering environmental impact assessments for offshore seismic surveys, were repealed. In conjunction with the exclusion of reconnaissance and mineral uh, exploration activities from the listed activities, in the schedules of the environmental impact assessment regulations promulgated in terms of the National Environmental Management Act. Further enabling regulatory lacunas include no overarching ocean governance under which Pakisa sits, no strategic environmental assessment of the offshore oil and gas sector has ever been implemented. After brushing aside the National Environmental Management of the Ocean White Paper, Pakisa authored the Alternate Marine Spatial Planning Act, which was only gazetted in April 2021, after having removed justice, equity, and transformation from its framework. According to numerous critiques, it hasn't, back, uh, it hasn't balanced the ecological with the economic, has no appeal mechanism nor ongoing public participation process mechanisms, there is also a Fox Guards the Hen House construct where the le legislative design gives the function of environmental regulation to the same department mandated to promote mining. However, this department is not mandated to consider climate issues. Where economists Macy and Bond hinted at this, this legislative manipulation, environmental scientist Dr. Jackie Sundy, in her working paper, Operation Pakisa and the Missing Mandate, reveals a methodical state capture of the oceans. She questions the legitimacy of ministerial authority when the necessary ocean governance framework required to implement constitutionally enshrined environmental rights is not being implemented. Sundy asks, when and where did Parliament take the decision that ocean oil and gas exploration could continue in the meantime without this imperative ocean governance framework? Meanwhile, only 5% of South Africa's oceans is protected. The Minister of, uh, for the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment oversees oil and gas Pakisa, and her department possesses only appellate jurisdiction. With this gross subjectivity in the statutory foundations of offshore oil and gas EIA process, Operation Pakisa is an imposition of imperial dimensions by state and corporate enterprises on a broad spectrum of South African sea users. The age-old use of an inextric inextricable spiritual connection to the oceans with some of the oldest heritage practices in the world is a very rich aspect of South African culture. South Africa's coastal people have withstood repeated dispossession and injustice. Oh, sorry, let's just get back there. The Pakisa imaginary is shaping problematic relations of dominion. 
over the ocean and its marine others, interested in affected parties, ocean users, intangible heritage, legislature, the precautionary principle and its opposing logic, and over future generations' well-being. This has located my own interventionist filmmaking as an insider within a registered interested and affected party engaged engaging offshore oil and gas permit applications, leveraging as experimental provocation the political use value of documentary impulse. Grounded in a decolonial eco-feminist approach, my aim is to shift the balance of visibility, interrupting the acceptability of Pekisa's petro monoculture by advancing counter histories, by thinking with interconnectedness with nature. Through film documentary review of stakeholder contentions, offshore Pekisa's rationality in the light of global warming developments, its inclusiveness in public participation processes, its dis disrespect of local intangible heritage, risk tolerance for ultra deep drilling, government capacity regards environmental compliance and mitigation, food security and energy return on energy invested becomes apparent. This practice, praxis is integral to my steering role in the Oceans Not Oil Coalition and combined epistemic refusal. It translates critical inquiry into action, firstly through engagement in legislative, regulatory and public participation processes, secondly through organizing collective protest, and thirdly through helping realize consensus and convergence on the complex issues of marine justice across diverse ocean-focused groups. By enabling partnerships and mass action, a resistant counter imaginary is being produced, delinking gas future narratives from seawater. Despite vulnerability to um, unemployment pressures in many fisher communities, the Oceans Not Oil movement remains galvanized against petro racism, which fails to recognize ancestral ocean ownership and tenure rights and meaningful consultation. Resultant lawsuits have stalled development of three offshore license applications to date. Although the CEO, CEO of Petro, Petroleum Agency South Africa confirmed um, that Italian oil major ENI has withdrawn from offshore KwaZulu Natal exploration collaboration with, with Sassel, ENI's attorneys, however, are not forthcoming. ENI remains party to the South Durban Community Environmental Alliance and others versus Minister of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries and others case of 2021. ENI and Sassel's attorneys have delayed in filing their answering papers. The CJ Adams and others versus Ministry, Minister of Mineral Resources and <coughs> Energy and others case of 2022 involved interdicting an enormous offshore seismic survey. You can see it there. Um, located between the South African Namibian border and Cape Gallus. West Coast residents and fisheries won their interdict, however, seismic ser uh, Searcher Seismic is applying to do another survey. The Oceans Not Oil campaign against shell exploration and production, or let's just call it Shell and Impact Africa Seismic Survey off the Wild Coast, petitioned ministers, mobilized coastwide protests, and shell outlet boycotts, resulting in exposure of local opposition in international media. The judgment in the Sustaining the Wild Coast, um, NPC and others, versus Minister of Mineral Resources and, and Energy and others, 2021 case became a benchmark one in recognizing the key role of oceans in livelihoods and the right to food security, the embedded spiritual and cultural connections of South Africans to the sea. That was a big one. The climate change impacts and considerations not taken into account when authorizing and renewing the application, another big one, that chiefs and kings do not have the legal right to speak for their communities, also huge, that the entire ocean community, including ocean others, needs consideration under the integrated coastal management system. Shell and impact Africa's exploration permit was set aside with costs, meaning they'll need to reapply and conduct a full EIA should they wish to pursue the project. Okay, nearly there. The delusion of Concord that gas as development converges with a national in interest pervades oil and gas Pekisa meta narrative, which until these recent court cases remained dissociated 
from climate change and global warming issues. These emissions work to keep inequalities around the climate consequences of continued hydrocarbon use invisible and limit critical analysis. EIAs for offshore exploration and production also fail to include estimates of end outputs relevant to future effects of greenhouse gas emissions and acceleration of global climate impact. Circumventing these higher order considerations feeds the Pakisa econo uh, economic development imaginary, controls political subjectivity, and creates what rhetorician Tom Hacken argues as a particularly potent form of propaganda, namely one of denial and delusion. The gas master plan, which includes offshore Pakisa, makes unreliable claims that gas for development is, is reparative economics, gas is clean energy, is needed for sustaining the grid combats energy scarcity and assumes well-run gas infrastructure. The fifth gas, gas to power independent power producer round was, has been budgeted at 2 Rand 47 a kilowatt hour, according to ESCOM's multi-year price determination submission, which is unjustifiably more expensive than the renewable energy projects modeled at 79 cents a kilowatt hour. Haworth and et al. have shown that the radiator forcing of methane means its larger global warming role than oil and, and uh, coal for any possible use of natural gas. Brown et al. have shown the feasibility and economic viability of a 100% renewable energy system for South Africa, which requires no reinvention of the power system um, and continually meets energy demand. In fewer years than the Padafisi gas production, there could be sufficient renewable energy um, uh, generation and storage technology to convert entirely to renewables. Pakisa um, imaginary resistance has provoked a rejoinder from the African National Congress, whose policy discussion papers of May 2020 proposed the stratagem of opposing politically those who oppose oil and gas. This emerging authoritarianism is redolent of political economist Michael Watt's warning that the continental shelf becomes the forcing house for the development of deep water and ultra deep water oil and gas production. Given that the interventionist documentary practice has helped build networks and solidarities and resistance, my ambition is that this research contributes to stalling all proposed wells until such time as the true social costs of gas development articulates the cessation of offshore Pakisa operations. Through exposing Pakisa's effects on democratic legislature and regulation, through warning of emerging, emerging social divisions near infrastructural developments, through showing gas as an ecocidal pollutant and harmful to economic development when substantially de de dependent upon, the project may meet a criteria of usefulness, what philosopher Jacques Rancière terms filling up the spaces left empty by power. And if I may, um, this whole hullabaloo about seismic surveys, and today there's a, the um, minister is down trying to woo uh, more fishes on the west coast in Saldana, and they're saying that seismic surveys have no effect. We know that it destroys planktonic life. And just to illustrate the fact that this is a blue marlin, it is planktonic life that gets decimated. And that, that whole um, emerging life, that larval stage in the ocean gets wiped out in, in enormous swathes kilometer long swathes, hundreds. I mean, that one on the West Coast will be two, nearly 200,000 square kilometers of seismic survey. It's got to have an effect when it's decimating the, the, the base of your, your entire ecosystem in the ocean. Thank you. Okay. Loudly because you want to 
looking at the next issue, right, and we are coming up to the summit with potential that institutions such as the African Union have proposed gas as the next transition of fuel in, in, in Africa. And with all these presentations, obviously, that would then ideally leave, you know, um, lock Africa in a fossil fuel future and also lock them, you know, in, in terms of stranded assets and, you know, a whole lot of other debates around that. But what is your take in terms of this, this big push, probably potentially because of the Ukraine, uh, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, creating that gas issue and energy crisis in Europe, we're winning off that, you know, uh, countries like in the G7 are coming into Africa and pushing for that gas. And now there's this whole big debate as sure. gas being viewed as the next transition of fuel in Africa. And also in that instance as well, looking at how probably greening ESCOM would have natural gas at the foundational level around that. How do you think that would potentially affect that study? And what are your views in terms of what exactly is really influencing in terms of African governments to adopt you know, rather a renewable energy future in comparison to a gas future. So what potentially could be one of the challenges that's stopping our leaders from actually realizing the challenges and the disadvantages of adopting that as a transition of fuel? Thank you, Becca Muzi. Um, well, let's take a few other questions online. Please post your questions um, and I can communicate that to the panel. Anybody else has any questions, comments? Yes, Bredson. One is for maybe just to draw attention of uh, I don't know how to spell it. Is it Kutney? Kutney? Yeah, Kutney. Um, and I just wanted to understand: Are you looking at a particular type of disaster, uh, or or are you going to look at one or two, two or I don't know how many? And if so, which one are you thinking of? Are you looking at cyclones? Are you looking at droughts? Are you looking at floods? What and the, the human impact? Uh, the impact on humans. This is my question. And the second, maybe just to draw your attention um, to, I'm sure you might have uh, already come across the the, um, the concept of uh, uh, cognitive dis dissonance, I guess. Um, and maybe if not, uh, uh, just to draw attention to that, cause, like because humans tend, human beings tend to sometimes stick to their beliefs, uh, even in, uh, when you, uh, you know, when they were presented with uh, facts. So you uh, probably have to um, go deep uh, into that um, notion because you will look, be looking at perceptions, right? This is my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, thank you. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Um, so for me, it's, it's a case of vested interests because you and I both know looking at that that timeline for gas, your gas bill is, a, um, I was working with a, a 30, 30 year to 40 year build out, your consequence of gas can be much longer than that um, in terms of just your build, and your decommissioning of these oil wells. These are oil wells that have just found, just um, struck oil. We've still got to build out to 2030, of an extra whatever, 18 oil, uh, 28 oil wells that, the, that they're wanting to get online. So they're going to be working with that till 2030. And then you've got another build out for another 40 years thereafter. So you're looking at 2070. So yeah, you do have your stranded assets issue. Um, and so much of it is illogical. So um, yeah. But then you've got this hushing and this quieting of science all the way along, and obviously government's got their their foot on the uh, on the brake in terms of renewable development. Am I answering your question enough? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So in terms of natural disasters, without getting too technical, um, because it is a very large N study, I'm looking at a range of natural disasters. So floods, droughts, um, heavy rainfall, extreme temperature, um, earthquakes, um, yeah, a whole host of natural disasters. It's all coming from kind of combined databases from the UN, from each country's kind of meteorological databases, things like that. Um, 
But yeah, the reason I'm doing a range of natural disasters is because I'm looking at regions, not country specific. So each region is susceptible to different kind of natural disasters. Um, I understand I'm taking on quite a bit by opening it up so broadly. Um, but because it is a mapping study, I'm hoping by the end of it, we have a huge kind of map of the continent where you can see exactly which areas experience which kind of natural disasters and how those people feel um, living in that kind of region, um, reflecting that. I'm not looking so much at the impact of those natural disasters. Um, I think if I open it up to that, then I'll probably be doing the study for like 10 years. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the parameters I'm looking at. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if you had anything else. Yeah. And then for your question, climate skepticism, climate denial, oh, and cognitive um, dissonance, um, that's obviously a challenge I'll be picking up along the way. And also I'll have to decide for myself how much I want to open it up to something like that. Um, but yeah, from the research, more often than not, people from the global north, because they've experienced kind of these campaigns about climate change, these awareness campaigns, their ideas of climate change are very different to ideas in African countries because um, a lot of people don't have access to information. So their ideas are very different and very land based, which is what my focus is, is looking at how when you personally experience something, how does that shape your worldview? How does your culture shape your worldview? Um, I mean, just in South Africa, we have hu like a huge issue of people denying climate change uh, when arguably there is a lot of access to information about it. But you have farmers who are very concerned about droughts, about floods. So they might not necessarily have this notion of climate change, but they have this concern for the environment, for their livelihoods, for food sovereignty. Um, so my idea is to just kind of bridge that and see where people's ideas are at, because that then shapes what they engage in. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. I'm finding where, for instance, with Shell, I've been doing a lot of work in Ponderland, um, and the obviously it's a conscientized area because of, of mining, but the farmers there are totally aware. Their, their um, hands on day-to-day -day experience, um, are they seeing seasonal shifts, they're seeing um, uh, influxes of bacteria um, affecting livestock. They're, they're seeing all sorts of shifts and changes um, that weren't there 10 years ago. So um, I think it kind of refers back to what Fish was talking about in terms of um, people that are experiencing this hands-on know a whole lot more than policymakers seem to be aware of right now. Um, so I think the assumption that um, because you're not getting a kind of pamphleteered climate change knowledge that's out there, that that knowledge is definitely there and it's definitely hands-on. Um, yeah, it'd be quite interesting to be able to measure that in some way. That's the hope. Thanks to your question, Janet. Um, so if I understand it correctly, you want to know if when I'm in the moment <laughs> with the with the um, biggest culprits, do I seize the moment to sort of question transformation, like in companies? Is that sort of where you were going with it? Do you get a sense of any kind of shift, any kind of thinking shift? So not are you kind of taking the podium so much as are you seeing your work, the efficacy of your work? I mean, it's a wonderful position to be in, just to be there. And what I treasure is that in that moment, I have an opportunity to at least plant a seed. And what I found working with us for a few years now is they actually resurface 
So those seeds that I've been planting, they pop up three, four years later. And like um, with Anglo, nothing happened in that moment, but the seeing that the creatures are coming to the origin center, it opens up the conversation and it's coming through the museum system. So there's a thread that follows it and it happened through like various processes. For instance, with Joburg Water, I was in a water meeting with all the water gurus of Joburg and I said, open up the sewers, they're bubbling up anyway. <laughs> and let's find green solutions so that it's um, treated on the spot. And that was sort of 2017-ish that I was hoeing some seeds in there. <laughs> and those kinds of things are now written into the plans. And so what I think is important is to stay with the process. So the stuff that you're criticizing, like even though you're the oddball artist in the room that's now got a science hat on, you get the opportunity to co-design futures because you are criticizing it. So rather than being an outsider and staying outside as a researcher or a rah-rah, <laughs> you know, fuck shell type thing, you... That's <laughs> I'm referring to those slides. <laughs> what, what I find more productive for me is to, to stay with the process and say that nasty stuff with people and not at them. Um, so, and also like for instance, just another quick example, how it manifests in the industry. I did these watershed walks like four years ago here, walking up because we've got this intercontinental divide between the Indian and the Atlantic oceans running through Joburg. And it was part of a whole program on watersheds and in one of the walks I had 67 people walk with me and it's an art activation to walk and talk about what's going on and then there's a sculpture that relates to it. One person said to me at the time he'd like to bring politicians, engineers on a technical walk and we're actually doing it tomorrow. So that's like four years of something simmering very slowly, <laughs> percolating. And then when the moment is right, those innovative things that you can propel it forward could happen. But you, you know, as an individual committed to the cause, stick with the process. In the difficult times, being criticized, not being criticized, or whatever, the art's not being heavy handed enough. What I find very productive is to stay involved so it's really it's a difficult spot to be in but it's like an in-between thing that the arts seems to be able to digest excellent there's another round now um, i just want to confirm there was a question from elias kodisank first about um we can't we can't pick up the panel's responses to questions is it possible to fix that so is it working uh, maybe I should just ask people online. Can you hear everybody? This is you muted. Can they hear me if I'm just speaking to the mic? Now. We can hear it now. Thank you. All those online, yes, can, can you hear us? Oh, yes. Yes, we can hear. Yes, yes we, can, we can hear you now. Yeah, they can hear us, which is good. Thank you. Okay, Elias Kodisang has a question for you, Janet. Um, I just have a follow-up on the impact of the Ukraine war. Germany and others are looking at reviving fossil fuel generation on the basis that base loads are required, something that they argue cannot be reliably provided by renewable energy sources. This argument has also been provided by Montash. How do we respond to this? So that's the one question. Are there any other final questions in the room for our panel? Okay, I'm just going to throw in one or two. Um, so Courtney, um, I think your study is very interesting. There's an assumption there also about the state. And, you know, we we are also in a context in which sort of third wave democratization in the African continent is faltering. Um, the African states, um, you know, has had decades of restructuring through neoliberalism. Uh, it's very weak, it's very incapacitated. Um, and in most instances is on um, sort of a lifeline, so donor aid and things like that. 
So you really don't have efficacious states in many parts of the continent. So I'm just wondering how, um, you know, your study is about, you know, sort of perception and then how that translates into action, how this is really going to work in the African context. You know? um, so that's my question. And Hanali, um, I really think this, this hidden third theory, love to hear more about that. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> well, even now, you know, just okay, if, sure. if you can just talk a little bit about how you kind of, um, what are the key ideas there and, and how have you kind of internalized that for your work, basically. And then maybe finally for Janet, and it's building on, on Elias's question. I mean, there's $400 billion um, dollars of investments now uh, lined up for gas on the African continent. Uh, it's it's going to get accelerated in the context of the Ukraine, well, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, the IEA, International Energy Agency, has backpedaled on its call uh, a few years ago saying no new investment in fossil fuels if we're going to survive. Uh, it actually said after the Ukraine conflict, um, gas is exempted, basically. Um, then you have, of course, the U.S. Um, kind of climbing into that context. It's now the number one gas and oil producer on our planet. And so... You know, despite Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, despite all the pronouncements at the Glasgow COP, etc., fossil fuel is still in the driving seat. I think that's what I'm saying globally. There's no displacement. Um, you know, there's no real break with it um, that's, that's coming to the fore. Actually, it's getting entrenched. Uh, fossil fuel prices are going up. They're making super profits, etc., etc. So th I think the question I'm getting at is... Is activism adequate for the situation, the kind of activism that's coming to the fore, um, the, the kind of symbolic activism that's coming to the fore, or do we need something more? Okay. Right, so who wants to go first? Maybe we'll start with Hanali and then come to Janet. Um, I don't think symbolic activism is enough. Um, I think... We have a history of symbolic activism, and it was for a very specific purpose. But I think if it's combined with an immersed moment where a realization is not only politicized, but also internalized through a climate logic, what I find quite harsh was um, symbolic activism is that it it criticizes, but it doesn't create an opportunity for a solution in the moment with the people that's most affected. It gets people going, <laughs> but I'm very interested in the solutions and a friendly solution that is conducive for a healthier future. For me, in my experience, is always born in a magical moment and those moments could be created in arts interventions or films where you are moved so deeply that you want to change yourself as well. And so the people on the ground doing the activism is so necessary. But I think if there's a way to um, inspire leaders to want to change as well, that's what I'm grappling with. <laughs> anyway, that's on the side. The third, see the hidden theory. The way I understand it is that we have these hardcore scientific patriarchal hierarchies. That's systemic and very much a heteronormative cause of climate change and then on the opposite spectrum of this rigidity which I was also born into in a religious way so on a very personal level I've had to unlearn all this rigidity that I was born into. Um, on the opposite side you have um, the lived experience and society's own um, 
day to day moment. That's the the reality on the ground. Um, and so what the Nicholas can transdisciplinarity um, theory creates is a space in between these two dichotomies that's not talking to each other. And it's very weird because it also sits between disciplines in academia. Being a transdisciplinary practitioner now, those innovative spaces between disciplines are so exciting. <laughs> but the hierarchical systems that set up doesn't embrace it. Um, so within this theory, I found for myself, I mean, for other people, it might be more sort of a spiritual connection or a religious connection. But for myself, uh, the arts, because it's so, especially with conceptual and contemporary art, um, it connects people on an emotional level really deeply. So there's like a riddle that you got to figure out. So if you walk into a museum, for instance, you know you're going to go there to go riddle your brain. <laughs> but in Southern Africa, we don't have so many museums and we don't have a museum going culture. So doing these kinds of contemporary conceptual artworks in public space creates opportunity for audiences to connect to this healthy future logic without having to um, go to a museum or want to go to a museum or to care for art. So it's interest in instrumentalization of the arts as an authentic medium, a tool that can that can just connect these opposite worlds. And I found that very well. Um, it's also very weird to study as a like mature student <laughs> to a master of science because you have this lived experience. Um, but what I found with that theory is that it brings it into a way of expressing it, where I think we can translate it and creating opportunity where activism can have a warmth, perhaps. That's what I'd like to see. <laughs> okay, we're running out of time, so each of you would give me. Okay. Um, so I'll try answer both questions in one. Um, I think there is an issue with studying the state from an international relations perspective when you are looking at the African continent, because when you look at the state here, it doesn't follow the textbook definition of a state. So you have to kind of reconceptualize how you look at it, um, which is why I've turned to the individual, to the region, um, things like that, because a lot of these spaces kind of go across border. Um, and as an IR student, that's not always kind of embraced by faculty or something like that. Um, because I am kind of disregarding the state, I am moving beyond that because it is something that isn't the easiest thing to study. And um, yeah, for me, it's just looking at the individual gives you so much more information. Um, and the same is true for activism. Um, it's very difficult to kind of conceptualize activism because I think a lot of us wanted to solve every issue and it's not as simple as that um same as the state policies things like that you can't have one thing that solves the entire issue and like you were saying as well it takes time something that you mentioned four years ago can have an effect now um so that's kind of just my approach with it is it takes time and you can't expect it to solve everything but we kind of have to work with what we have I know that's not a super helpful answer, but that's my perspective at the moment. OK, so um, I think the answer for Elias's question is obviously a geopolitical one where suddenly you've got gas, you've got um, Putin strangulating gas supply and you've got this 
kickback from a dying industry, um, which has been really strong, and the beneficiation from the shift, you know, the geopolitics of gas moving from east um, to to America, you know, of course, uh, there's going to be this 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 pegging in and this um, reversal that we're seeing with from really great ballsy um, the EIA was really really ballsy last year and has has um, stepped backwards on that those commitments um, again for me it's it's again it's vested interests and um, I believe that we have the science it's not it's not perfect science. We have the science, we have the engineering, we have the imagination um, to shift things. And yeah, renewables aren't, aren't you know, the um, aren't golden yet. There's lots in terms of of mistakes that we're going to make going forward, but we have to start making them. You know, I think we have to start um, shifting that. And in terms of activism, my activism, um, like you, I work in a way that's mercurial. Uh, we, I work around structures, within structures, so within the policy making, within the regulations, as, as a, a body critiquing. Um, also, the background work on the film for me is, is a connectivity one, where you're networking and connecting people all the time and posing questions. I think we must never underestimate the power of the question. A question is a hugely powerful thing, especially for somebody who deems themselves expert. So as soon as you pose that question in that space, so I find in an interview space, you're posing a question, the expert is then put on the spot to answer that question. And that in itself shifts things. And it, it might shift things slowly. It might, might shift them fast. But um, yeah, I mean, my film, my last film was premiered in 2018. There was a bioacoustics conference, I think, t back a year or two later that started to shift policy. So, um, yeah, it does happen slowly. And I think as an artist and interdisciplinary, one does make those kind of connections. And I think that's a really, those are really important spaces to play with. But is there a role for activism? Absolutely. And I say that I say that for youth movements that I'm involved with is a categorically a need for for broad groupings to feel some kind of sense of agency. I think that's fundamental and it's really important. Um, and it's really important from banking institutions to understand that these are their future investors that are standing there putting saying no all the way across to, to government. Is government going to change? I've been in the room with, um, I'm not going to say it live yet because it will be in the film, but I've been in the room with a person deeply connected with um, uh, the growth of our gas industry. And we, she's just said to me, ha -ha, um, I'm not going to be alive in 100 years' time. So, And that's great for film, but it's not great for, for our future. So... Um, yeah, you know, these are the issues that we have to deal with. We're dealing with people who have got um, vested interests, very deep vested interests, party interests, um, and we have to follow the money. So it's a case of following the money. I think it's it's got to be intelligent activism, Bush. Great. On that note, we're going to break the tea. Janet.